Welcome to BioCentury This Week, the podcast for BioCentury's editorial team. I'm Jeff Cranmer, executive editor here at BioCentury, and I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves. I am Simone Fishburn, editor in chief. Karen Takach Tusman, director of Biopharma Intelligence. And I'm Steve Usden, Washington editor. On today's podcast, a deep dive into the hot radio pharma space. Two influential lawmakers, as far as biotech policy goes, have announced they will not return to Congress next year. What does that mean? And a BioNTech investment in the UK. Plus, we check in on the XBI and how it is faring. Of course, everyone keeps a close watch on that. But first, BioCentury and Bay Helix's East West. Biopharma Summit is returning next March. It's the third edition of the conference, and this time around we'll be in Singapore after our successful event in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the fall. Also, next spring, BioCentury's BioEquity Europe, more than 20 years in the running. Uh, last year's conference in Dublin sold out. This year we'll be in the culinary hot spot of deliciousness that is San Sebastian, Spain. You can find out more at biocentury.com. We're currently recruiting presenting companies and are hoping you'll join us at both conferences. All right, this week on Biocentury, we'll publish Karen's deep dive into the increasingly hot radio pharma space, which in the past decade, has seen key approvals and billion dollar deals by Bayer, Novartis, and most recently, Eli Lilly. Karen, let's start with an overview. How is the space divided up? Well, this is a space that is really, um, it's based on a modular technology and therefore it is really multi-dimensional. There's a lot of choices companies make when putting these together, deciding are they gonna go for an alpha emitting radioisotope or a beta emitting one? What is their target going to be? What is their ligand modality going to be? And so this analysis takes a dive into companies and the strategies they've taken, the investment uh, flowing into the different strategies and the sort of pros and cons of different approaches and how top leaders in the space are thinking about it. Yeah, Karen, I think what's struck me recently about radio pharmaceuticals is I know that it's sort of been around historically for a long while, but in the last few years, it's really been Novartis that's been sort of banging the drum on that technology. And suddenly it feels like, in, I don't know, maybe the last six months it's come across my radar. So many other people talking about it from bankers, Gil Barnaher mentioned it, a couple of others as an area to invest in. And I think you document in your piece the sort of innovation edge, you know, have you got new codes that are being created in that area or at least investments going in there? So, you know, do you feel that there was a particular trigger for this new trajectory? Yeah, I think the, um, well, people trace back to sort of the Algida acquisition by Bayer in 2013. That was an alpha emitter, but it was sort of different than what we're seeing now because that that compound, it's radium-based and it has natural bone homing properties. So it didn't need a ligand modality. But really in 2017, 2018, that's when we saw the Novartis acquisitions of Endocyte and Advanced Accelerator, Advanced Accelerator applications. Um, and both of those are this uh, sort of modular, molecularly targeted radio pharmaceuticals where you have the uh, radioisotope itself, lutetium-177. You've got uh, a targeting moiety, in one case a small molecule, in the other case a peptide. And you saw some clinical efficacy and, and then commercial proof of concept, as well as the acquisition takeout prices that really sort of ignited the space. And since then, of course, we recently had the acquisition of Point by Eli Lilly for $1.4 billion just back in October. And so the pharma interest has been part of it. The clinical readouts and the commercial prospects have been part of it. And, you know, with 
Novartis is Pluvicto. This is their prostate cancer uh, radiopharmaceutical. It was approved in 2022. They had the launch. And in this past year, they had manufacturing issues that held up the launch. And it's still on track to being a $1 billion in sales for the year, as guided in the last quarterly update from Novartis. And so it's something where people really see the potential for the modality to go to lots of places. The challenge has been um, aligning all of the variables to make a product that works, threads the needle between having enough tumor residence time to be effective, but clears out quickly from the kidney and uh, circulation. Threading that needle is not trivial and getting that done for new targets has been harder. And so we do see a lot of clustering around the two top targets with commercial proof of concept, the SSTR2 and PSMA. Those are from the two Novartis products. But we're also seeing target innovation. And one of the things the analysis does is identify the sort of top 10 targets coming up next in radio pharma pipelines where people are starting to thread the needle with different ligand modalities, with different radioisotope types. Karen, when I look at radio pharmaceuticals, you know, structurally, and even in terms of what they try to do, there are so many analogies with ADCs. They're modular. They, you know, are sort of three components, and each of them is an area where you could innovate or find different value. And ADCs have really taken off this year, maybe the last couple of years, but we're just sort of seeing this skyrocketing interest. So do you see these as something that, Radio pharmaceuticals can go in that direction, can be as big as ADCs. Do you think it's something that every farmer is going to want to have in their wheelhouse? How are you looking at that? Is it part of the competitive landscape or just sort of alongside it? It is part of the competitive landscape. It's got some unique advantages and challenges. One of the things is that it's even more modular than ADCs because in ADCs, the a, you know, antibody targeting, whereas in radio pharmaceuticals, we've got small molecules, peptides, the sort of small protein class, like single domain antibodies and DARPINs and things, and then antibodies as well. So there's, that's this a whole other dimension to them. And one of the challenges that radio pharmaceuticals face um, first is this kind of need for just-in-time manufacturing, because the thing about radioactive things is that they decay. And so you need to time the delivery, the production of it, to getting it to your hospital. In the right timing, you need physicians in the hospital, uh, the nuclear medicine physicians and the oncologists to be working together to deliver these. And then there's also uh, historically been challenges around radioisotope supply, just at the very top of the chain. Where do you get your lutetium from? Where do you get your actinium from? Uh, those challenges are starting to be overcome. Actinium manufacturing in particular, there's been a real rise in demand for this. And so the supply has been growing alongside it. So those are some kind of unique features that the ADC field doesn't face. And it sounds like, you know, talking to people in this space, that getting that balance right of the payload and the delivery and the talks might be a bit more challenging. However, the potential for the damage that they can induce to cancer cells. And in particular, people have been excited about alpha emitters, including actinium. And, you know, we dive into this in the analysis because of their uh, killing range. They're able to be really precise, um, but without necessarily requiring internalization of the ligand by the cell. And so I think it's a modality that has a lot of potential that a lot of pharmas will want in their pockets. It, it's sort of adjacent to, but different from ADCs. One last point on this. It did actually come up in my BioCentury show interview with Fiona Marshall, the head of research at Novartis who also talked about some of those sort of point of care logistical issues, such as you talk about the very short turnaround time and so on, because you've got a, a radioactively decaying material. I also asked her and wonder if you've spoken with people, you know, what that means for the ability for this to be done in community hospitals. You know, you tend to think about very logistically demanding therapies as being limited to the major medical centers, 
she said Novartis is committed to increasing sort of nuclear medicine capabilities in many, many hospitals. What are your thoughts about that? Well, it's interesting. This question of centralization versus decentralization has come up uh, when talking to people for this analysis. Um, And it kind of varies by the radioisotope. So for example, uh, lead 212 is a radioisotope that's taking off. And there, it has a shorter half-life than most of them. Most of them is on the order of days, leads on the order of like uh, hours. And in that case, there's a couple of companies that have uh, the path they're taking is by developing benchtop generators that can be used in decentralized ways. Uh, others take a centralized approach to lead to and two. But in general, that it's a live question uh, among people in this space is, do you really want a sort of centers of excellence where this becomes routine versus, you know, getting it out to more places, but maybe there's one or two patients who receive that medicine per year and there doesn't, uh, there isn't a sort of routine and um, comfortable practice with it. And so uh, that that's a very live question and it, and it varies in particular by radioisotope and different companies are taking different strategies around it. Karen, I'm I'm curious about some of the key players. You, we've mentioned Bayer, Novartis, Lilly with its acquisition of Point recently. I know there's some smaller players like Raise, which recently went public. What are some of the companies that you're you're watching that might not be some of these headline names? One that really stood out to me was uh, Telix. They're based in Australia, and they're uh, one of these kind of few mid-cap public companies in this space, they've really assembled a pretty diverse set of radiopharmaceuticals through deals, through licensing, alpha and beta emitters, some radioisotopes that are, you know, outside of the, the main two. They're an interesting one to watch. It was interesting. There's a number of sort of Australia headquartered companies that cropped up in this space, uh, some of the micro caps. And, but Telix is one that stood out to me. And then there's this whole kind of, there's sort of three main buckets of players in this space. One is sort of new co's founded to do this, to be radio pharmaceuticals companies. But then you have sort of the ligand modality players. So things like molecular partners or bicycle, where it's like they are therapeutics ligand platform companies, and they see um, an application for their technology with radio pharmaceuticals. And then you've got the kind of more legacy uh, radionuclide suppliers, diagnostic developers like ITM, you know, radiomedics, players that were historically not in the therapeutic space, but are now building out radiopharmaceutical therapeutics pipelines. And so it's an interesting mix and definitely a space to watch and one that was um, fun, but quite uh, laborious to map as we have done. Yeah, it uh, it's it's quite the impressive dive into the space. Uh, I think BioCentury's readers will be quite interested in getting their hands on it. You'll have a slide deck that goes along with this, uh, which is downloadable. So look for that in the coming days on BioCentury. And actually, uh, one of the cool things that's also coming out of this is we now have a new filter option in our BCIQ database for radio pharmaceuticals under therapeutic modality. Um, so that's one of the product filters we have in BCIQ. So you can do your own dive into this space as well if you are a BCIQ subscriber. Excellent. Well, thanks for that, Karen. Let's turn to Washington now. Two longtime lawmakers who have been very influential on biotech issues. Anna Ashu, a California Democrat and Michael Burgess, a Republican from Texas, have announced their retirement at the end of the current Congress. Steve, what's this mean for policy on biotech issues? Well, it's interesting. You know, I was thinking about it. If you if you were to think about it, you know, Michael Burgess and Anna Eshoo, uh, you wouldn't think that they would agree on much, and you'd think they're about as opposite as any two members of Congress. Burgess represents a conservative district in North Texas. He was first elected to Congress in 2002 as a proud member of the Tea Party Caucus. He voted against certifying President Biden's election. He's endorsed former President Trump for the 2024 election. 
He opposes abortion. He wants to overturn the Affordable Care Act. Eshoo represents Silicon Valley. She's a liberal Democrat. She was first elected to Congress in 1992. She's a staunch supporter of President Biden, voting with him uh, just about 100% of the time. She's an advocate of abortion rights. She strongly backs drug price regulation, including the Medicare drug price negotiation program that was included in the IRA. But they both are strongly backed by the biopharmaceutical industry. They've both received a large share of their campaign contributions from the biopharma industry. They both received accolades from, from the industry. Eshoo was the member of Congress who was most responsible for giving biologics 12 years of exclusivity as part of the biosimilars pathway that was created by the Affordable Care Act. And they've got other things in common. Um, both of them sought to be the top member of their party in the Energy and Commerce Committee in 2020. Burgess uh, lost out to Kathy McMorris Rogers, who's now the committee chair. In 2014, Eshoo lost out to Frank Pallone, who was chair and now is ranking Democrat. You know, and, and, and I, I think actually probably their defeats and those leadership challenges played into both of them deciding that they're not going to um, run again for their seats. Both of them played leading roles in shaping FDA user fee reauthorization bills. They were kind of among the very, very small number of members of Congress who know and care a great deal about FDA, and I would say even about the biopharma industry in general. They both support the Pasteur Act, a bill that seeks to provide advanced market commitments to incentivize the development of drugs to overcome antimicrobial resistance. Both of them supported the 21st Century Cures Act that gave FDA new authorities and obligations that were intended to speed the development of new medicines. You know, there are a number of things that they disagreed on also. Um, they disagreed on the right to try bill. Uh, Burgess was a big backer of that bill which became law, Eshoo opposed it, and there are any, any number of other issues. But I think, that, I think that their careers and the way that they're kind of intertwined show how there has been a history of bipartisan cooperation on issues having to do with the biopharma industry, on especially some of the nitty-gritty issues having to do with FDA and NIH funding and things like that. And I think that losing Burgess and Eshoo will make things more difficult for companies and for the industry as they, they look for members of Congress who not only understand their issues, but, um, but even care about them. Steve, I imagine it is too soon to know who you know, might be going for those seats. Are there any other shoes to drop in terms of people stepping down that might you know, influence the shape for biopharma for our industry? Yeah, there, there's a there's a lot of members of Congress and and some in the Senate also who are leaving, and some who are running for other offices. If they don't reach those, reach those goals, they they may also be leaving involuntarily. Uh, Katie Porter, who's been kind of a nemesis of the industry on um, drug pricing issues, is running for the Senate. Ben Cardin, a Democrat senator from Maryland, is retiring. Um, so is Carper from Delaware. Both of them have been staunch supporters of, of President Biden and of drug price regulation. It's not clear who's going to um, step in for either of those. But I think generally there's, you know, one way to look at it is there's going to be a, a loss of, uh, of a great deal of expertise that's associated with drug development, with drug regulation um, and drug pricing issues. You know, on the other hand, I think there's probably a, a, a large contingent of people who are going to be glad to see some generational change um, in both houses of Congress and, uh, and an opportunity to educate whoever comes in about the issues that the biopharma industry cares about. All right. Thanks for that, Steve. Let's head to the UK. German mRNA company BioNTech is again expanding its global footprint, announcing a billion pound 10-year investment in a new lab in Cambridge and a center of expertise for AI in London, this comes on the heels of a flurry of deals in Asia. Simone, what do you think about what BioNTech is building here? I think there's two sides of this that interest me. One is that in the UK, we've seen really big companies like AstraZeneca and GSK plant some very big footprints as they have in Cambridge and whatever. Obviously, they're from there. But, you know, they've created sort of um, 
innovation hubs or labs and so on ways of interacting. But I, I don't think I've seen this really at the level of a, a company like BioNTech, which is a German company, of course. So there's a certain momentum, I suppose you could say, for what's going on in the UK that draws BioNTech there. But the other side of it, as you pointed out, is is let's keep an eye on BioNTech. They have been prolific in their deals with Asia companies. They're now planting a fairly big flag in the UK. They're becoming a global company. And when we had Ryan Richardson, who is the chief strategy officer at BioNTech, on the panel at our event uh, on the sidelines of the Jefferies Conference, he sort of indicated that, you know, this might be news to us, but it was in the plan for them all along. You know, they always plan to go big. And um, according to him, they're sort of executing to plan. It, obviously, I would assume that the influx of capital that they got with the success of the vaccine, the mRNA vaccine, has, you know, enabled some of those plans that they may not have had otherwise or at the pace that they may not have had otherwise. I, I don't know. We will be talking to them. But I think that, yes, it's a it's a pretty interesting development, pretty becoming a pretty interesting company to watch. And we're talking now not just about vaccines, right, but also about therapeutic development and Absolutely. including in, um, in cancer, right? Absolutely, Steve. In fact, this doesn't seem to be positioned around vaccines or isn't really positioned around infectious disease at all. In the summer, the UK government and BioNTech announced an agreement to provide up to 10,000 patients with precision cancer immunotherapies by 2030. So part of that part of uh, the relationship is very heavily skewed to cancer. And the latest announcement talks about a new laboratory in Cambridge and a center of expertise for AI in London. So yes, I think this is well beyond mRNA vaccines and I assume into therapeutics. And as I mentioned, uh, they have done a few deals in Asia this year, and a few of those have focused on ADCs. Now, they're not out buying CGen by any means. They're picking their spots, smaller companies, they're pounding the pavement in China. They've done deals with Biotheus, uh, which is a relatively new player that's done a flurry of deals, as well as a company called Metalink. So they're picking their spots and steadily growing. You know what, Jeff, like commentators curse, tomorrow they'll probably announce some huge deal. <laughs> <So>. oh, well, <laughs> that's, that's the way this industry rolls. It's... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Wouldn't say no to more deals, that's for sure. Um, definitely need to see things continue to pick up or start picking up. Uh, however, you're seeing the glass half full, half empty. And speaking of that, the XBI, how about that? Simone, after hitting a low of about 64 in October, the XBI has had a nice run in the past few weeks. It's now up about 14% in the past month. Granted, it's down 10% or so on the year. We, of course, have been in one of the worst biotech markets we've ever seen. This is certainly a bright spot. Simone, I, did you pick up any chatter at Jeffries on, uh, on that front? Well, you know, I, I guess I look at it this way, Jeff. So, uh, you know, chatter, the chatter is, what's the XBI today? What's the XBI going to be next week? So a lot of eyes are on it in a way that obviously they haven't really been uh, in the last few years when times were good. You know, on the other hand, I think um, what really people are looking at is the direction of it, not this <laughs> actual value at the moment. So there's a little bit of whiplash. It's like, oh, gosh, what a terrible week it went down. And oh, what a great week it went up and net net, probably not changing tremendously. We'll see. We'll see. I don't uh I don't know where it'll go, but I think it will continue to be a very watched statistic for the industry. And there's a certain question out there, which is how much is it specifically tied to the broader macroeconomic uh, environment? And, you know, will it outperform the S&P may depend to some degree on how the S&P itself does, not just how XBI does. So those are questions swirling around. 
All righty. Well, Steve, Simone, Karen, thanks for all the thoughts today. Thank you out there for tuning in. Kendall Square Orchestra provides music for BioCentury this week. The group connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education. We will catch you next week.